The pros and cons of implantables. When I talk about implantables, I mean things that are embedded into the subcutaneous layer of the skin. That's beneath the skin, under the skin, technology, like microcircuitry and nanotechnology. Welcome to my talk. My name's Katina Michael, and I'm from the University of Wollongong. I'm a professor there. I'm also a senior member of the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology. I've had the great fortune of editing the IEEE Technology and Society magazine for the last six years. This society is amazing, it brings together brains from engineering through to psychology, sociology, uh, anthropology, law, you name it. I've had the good fortune of being part of that society and this talk dovetails onto the fact that we're a society that looks at all these multidisciplinary approaches. I'm also a senior member and senior editor of the IEEE Consumer Electronics magazine. So let's begin talking about implantables with a historical backdrop. Two decades of non-medical implantable devices. Where have we been? And how did I get involved in this industry to begin with? Well, the story starts here. I was about 20 years of age when I joined Nortel Networks Australia doing telecommunications planning as a graduate engineer. One day, I walked into the office, pulled out the Nortel World newspaper from my tray, put it on my desk and landed it on the back page. There was an article about this size of a column talking about the Cyborg 1.0 experiment that Nortel Networks was going to sponsor. Meanwhile, I was doing my PhD on smart card innovation and thinking, where is the future taking us? So here I was working in my day job as an engineer and I read that my corporation is sponsoring Professor Kevin Warwick at the University of Reading. Years later, I bump into his PhD student who actually received and was a recipient of the money Nortel had provided for spinal cord research and telecommunications visionary planning. He implanted Professor Kevin Warwick a tiny microchip into his left arm. It was only for 10 days or so. And not long after, in 1999, Peter Cochrane of BT, a chief scientist there, came out with his classic book, Tips for Time Travellers. In that book, he talks about the soul catcher chip, 2004, post-September 11. We're all talking about risk. Scott Silverman comes out at Applied Digital Solutions and talks about implantables that may have helped first responders. Imagine a world where at least embedded devices could trigger some kind of alert for first responders to leave a building if it was on fire, burning down. So many lives potentially saved. The Get Jip campaign was a trademark campaign. In fact, many people don't realise that this technology is not new. Three Square Market has purportedly been the first organisation in the US to have its employees chip implanted, but hey, that's old news. SSIT have been researching this for about 20 years. So get chipped. They estimated 100,000 people might receive a discount for a cylindrical transponder that was FDA approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the US. The site of the implant uh, by the FDA was recommended to be the right tricep in the upper arm deep within the subcutaneous layer. There was even a chip mobile van going around the state of Maryland as if citizens of the US would go to a blood bank you know, visit and get a chip implant during their lunch hour. A bit like Dogs and Cats and the Companion Act in New South Wales, Australia. Perhaps a future that says everybody should be chipped, perhaps not. I had the good fortune of visiting the Baja Beach Club while it was still in operation in Barcelona, Spain. I walked into the very building that was inviting patrons for less than $100 to have a stored value on an e-payment card uh, and, and also an implant uh, at any location they wanted to. Baja Beach Club ignored FDA's recommendation of the right arm and they said we can put it anywhere we want and they started to deploy this. And as patrons came in with the chip, the entry gantry point which was rigged up to read the RFID would immediately detect that an implantee had come in, a patron with an implant. And his or her name would actually light up uh, on an LED display saying, you know, the cool one has arrived and uh, they could go around the club and have VIP access and also store value, buy their drinks with such a chip. Citywatcher.com, 2006. Sean Darks, the CEO of this small surveillance company that worked for a government in Cincinnati, Ohio, keeps forgetting his past and thinks, hey, there must be a better solution to this. So he recommends and seconds uh, Mr. Gary Rutherford, a consultant, who is an advocate of the very chip 
and says, hey, come on, Gary, let's do something different here. Let's implant ourselves. So 20 years ago, not just this year. The biohacking movement. 2006, Emil Grafstra writes his classic book, which is sold out instantly, RFID Toys. It doesn't take long for IEEE Spectrum to catch on and report on this in 2007, the murky waters of RFID implants. We see on the front cover, me and my RFIDs, as if the RFIDs are humans and alive. Jonathan Oxo, head of Linux and president of Linux Australia, is seen here with his home automation company, walking in and having physical access control in his home with their implants. Fast forward now about a decade. Emil Grafstra, after visiting Wollongong, Australia, uh, as a keynote at an, the International Symposium of Technology and Society, writing numerous papers with SSI team members and being interviewed by them, starts his company, DangerousThings.com. He's selling NFC chips, RFID chips, biomagnets that you can implant, even things like the Vivo key based on NXP semiconductor smart card innovation and cryptographic techniques. Embed this device, you have identity, security, crypto, potentially even e-payments. Are we going that way? But what's the state of play right now? What's been happening over the last 12 to 18 months? Well, I think we're moving away from the rhetoric of the Internet of Things to the Internet of Us. We call it the eye plant in our research team at Wollongong Uni. It's ubervalence, it's the sense of you, it's the lowest common denominator. And you know this stuff about it being the size of a grain of rice? Well, forget about that. I've seen things on either end of the spectrum, small spots, almost invisible to the naked eye, built by companies like Impinge, incredible innovations that could find themselves not just on people, but on assets and absolutely everything. I've also seen large chunky devices, of which I'll show you in a moment. Physical access control. The Epicenter building invites the 50 companies located within its premises, over 2,000 employees, hey, to forget about those semiconductor cards and just get an implant to use the photocopiers, to use access control mechanisms to get into the building. And at the bottom left, we see a company uh, by Shanti Corporal here in Australia with husband Steve Stevens, uh, Chip My Life. She's entering her premises uh, through a microchip as well. We saw Andreas Schostrom, um, the vice president of digital for Sujeti, get on a plane, a Scandinavian Airlines plane, without a physical boarding pass. His boarding pass was his implant and he was bound from Stockholm to Paris. Quite an incredible thing. Ticketing. SJ Rail has invited patrons to consider implants. And here we see an inspector get onto the train and actually look at some, whether somebody's actually paid for their, their, their trip. And we can see the very ease of having uh, the scanner chip. Somebody takes a device like a reader or a mobile phone and scans the chip on the body. You know, most implantees say, you can't track people with um, an RFID or NFC device. It's discreet, ladies and gentlemen. It's not continuous. We know that RFID is not GPS, that's old news. But actually, every reader, every exit entry point has a location coordinate. So yes, we know which direction the implantee is traveling in. We know when they've left the room, when they've come in, and that's really all we need to do predictive analytics. You don't need 24 seven monitoring. But in the future, if your mobile phone has a GPS, which all of our phones now do, and it's very close as you pick it up and your implant is in your hand, it does a read, ladies and gentlemen. So the RFID is local to the human body, but the GPS is tethered on the mobile phone. You don't have to have everything in the embedded sensor. These are all innovations and use cases happening today. Groundhouse Wetware, a biohacking company. Look at this. A chunky North Star magnet activated and LED equipped subdermal device. Do it yourself. Brings a new meaning, doesn't it? So yeah, a dot, size of a, a grain of rice, or something even chunkier. Hmm. Autodesk Research, Canada. An ACM chai paper on implantable user interfaces. This participant observer, first person observer of this corporation, implanted himself with this device. The device had a vibration motor, an LED sensor, a speaker, a tap sensor, a tactile button, and a pressure sensor. Hmm, harm, self-harm perhaps? Or reaching new points on how we diffuse innovation and novelty. I wonder what he felt like as he was walking around with this. And I wonder what he felt like perhaps as he was tapping away. Are these our new input devices? 
I will challenge you. So yes, we do have things the size of a grain of rice, but we also have larger things. And the body is limited. How many of these things can we hold in our body? And who will own these brands? Visa, who's doing research here in Australia with UTS on future implantables and scenarios around them. Cisco, who's looking at the Internet of Medical Things platform and waiting there. American Express, that is purportedly the credit card company working with Three Square Market. And recipients of the implants are not well educated. I heard an employee from Three Square Market actually say and call the RFID implant a reader. So the black box beneath the skin is the problem. Here's another device. It almost looks like we've taken our mobile phone and implanted it in our forearm. Where are we going to stop? How many of these are we going to implant? And are they going to be space junk in the body? This is courtesy of Tim Cannon, who's tethered up his Cicardia device to his tablet. And that tablet is now receiving physiological characteristics and vital signs. Of course, we can see some of the benefits. The benefits are clear, but at what costs and at what harms? Let's talk about this. What are the pros? Any engineer you could speak to, of course there's benefits in these technologies. Of course, being not linked to batteries and wires and forgetting about which cable fits into what device, there is a certain amount of perceived freedom around these. In fact, you can do things like control uh, in campus locations. You can have ultimate convenience, freedom from these wires. It's about care and being able to remotely monitor someone for human activity, especially with fall-down alerts, of course we can see the benefits, of course we can see the cool factor, but our research is showing us, independent of whether it's about control, convenience, care, or even coolness, the underlying function, ladies and gentlemen, is control. It's about tagging, tracking, tracing. We're using these things to uh, chip and identify our livestock so that we stop foot, foot and mouth outbreak diseases and so many other things like mad cow. Of course we see the benefits. We also saw in 2014 Spectrum come out with an article that he its headline read, Medtronic wants to implant sensors in everyone. Well imagine that, coming to into the world, having a sensor smaller than a AAA battery in, s in your body for vital signs, being able to detect when you're going to fall ill or your temperature's rising or you're about to fall down or you've had too much to eat. But the possibilities of this data ending up for nefarious purposes is huge on the dark web or even to determine your health insurance premium. It's like a black box recorder. You don't know what's in the black box. You can be told it's just an RFID chip or an NFC, but what else is it carrying? And perhaps we don't need to care. But the ultimate idea of this black box beneath the skin is it's like a flight recorder an, or an, on an aeroplane. We've already seen Ross Compton's pacemaker data subpoenaed in a court case to show that he committed arson in September of 2016. This is heart pacemakers. So imagine a black box recorder of sorts that gives you convenience, but the trade-off is that possibly it might snitch on you or it might set you up in ways that you never expected. So the cons, privacy, the retrospective use of data being collected, security, and we don't have to look at recent security reports. I mean, back in 2004, Gartner took this very seriously when the Verichip came out. They said microchip implants won't deliver security. So what are we doing, ladies and gentlemen, suggesting that these are physical access control devices? They are insecure. RFID and NFC, by their very nature, are therefore broadcasting, I'm here, I'm here, come and get me. Trust issues, surveillance issues, health risks, mental health risks. There are already people in society that call themselves the tortured, who believe they've been implanted by these devices. In the future, we will have to take these concerns more seriously. Some people think they're always surveilled as they exit their home. I get emails from at least one person every two weeks telling me that they're sure they've been implanted by these devices. So what are we doing to address these mental health concerns? And what about human rights? What about the fact that you can't remove these devices by yourself? It's difficult. I don't believe those people, those biohackers that say you can just pop out your device whenever you feel like it. That's not right, ladies and gentlemen. Tissue wraps around that. The American Veterinary Association, Medical Association in the States, the AVMA, back in 2007 when there were concerns over tumours and cancers in pets over RFID implants, wrote something saying 
do not try to remove the chip from your animal at home. You can find those reports online. Death by internet. My dear friend Joseph Kavalka, who's a recipient of multiple heart pacemaker implants, has come out with a novel looking at the future. Yes, digital implants that might help us with insulin and pumping drugs into the body. But what if you were to hack that implant? What if you were to hack those pacemakers, those cochlear implants that are now being touted for not just hearing, but also entertainment services? What happens when you can render someone dead in three seconds flat or a millisecond if you've busted into the proprietary uh, code? We will go zapping people around. Is that the future predatory hacking? Here is Mark Gasson, Kevin Warwick's PhD student who's now uh, working in industry. Mark was the general chair of the IEEE Symposium on Technology and Society in 2010. And he demonstrated to us how you can put a virus on a microchip and that it's got huge implications of doing that. Here he demonstrated an SQL injection attack. Dilemmas and approaches forward. Ladies and gentlemen, SSIT believe there are never complete solutions, just approaches to complex problems and wicked problems. This is not like building a bridge. This is something more invasive. And our innovations are becoming more personalised, more diagnostic based and more predictive. And linked up to policing, they have their own implications. Now, you might well be a civil libertarian, the vocal minority, screaming out, watch out for your privacy. You might have a faith or a particular creed, independent of what it is, Christian, Muslim, or uh, anything, Buddhist. You may not agree ideologically or spiritually with the whole fundamental notion of getting an implant. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what you believe and why you believe it. What matters is that you have a right to reject it. At the moment, the body modification movement is growing rapidly. Will we have cyborg 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 and people that are the have-nots? This will change social inclusion greatly. We're not just talking about having access to the internet or a smartphone with an e-payment scheme. We're talking about various implantables. And the question is, will we be able to communicate in the future on the same level playing field. If some of us have neural interfaces based on microchip wet wetware and other, others of us have, have nothing, don't even have access to the internet, how will we communicate when someone is going at 100 miles per hour with thought processes and others are just trying to get the words out? Engineers too, while they think that this technology is so savvy, so futuristic, so incredible, want to see how far they can go. In 2005, I created this network architecture view of an implant device communicating with a smartphone and theref thereafter having various levels of uh, visibility on the network from the local area network to the wide area network and beyond globally through a network approach uh, and also through a chipset approach. We could store someone's hierarchical position. We could know who they are, where they are and contextually what they're possibly even doing. M.G. Michael coined the term ubervalence to denote this whole process, ID, location, condition. Well, what can go wrong when we predict someone's context? Well, technology can never give us the God's eye view. It is never omniscient. At best, it's omnipresent. It can actually provide misinformation to people using data-driven approaches. People can misinterpret the data, and it can also be manipulated. You can set up people, you can assume they were doing things that they weren't because of this black box that we don't have access to in terms of the algorithms, the storage of the data on databases and so forth. And who owns this data? The companies? Well, in the heart, case of heart pacemakers at the moment, that's what they're saying to recipients. They don't even own their own EEG stream, their own biometric. Will we be able, with Big Brother on the inside looking out, to get into people's brains? So what are some of the approaches we put forward. Engineering by design. The great Anne Kavukian talks about privacy and security. Regulatory approaches. Roger Clark, Simon Davies of the Australian Privacy Foundation and the Global Foundation talk about the freedom to choose. The social contract. Tavani and Moore talk about individual level concern and the rights of the individual. Dr. Catherine Albrecht talks about the potential for a bodily integrity act and for law to help us when potentially these things uh, come onto the fore. Enforced chipping, 
has been outlawed in nine states, at least in the US, last time I checked. All of this builds on an ethical framework, and SSIT is all about bringing researchers together, subject matter experts in their own domain, to discuss the social implications. And there are great implications when we use devices like this to read devices that are in our bodies, when we use RFID asset management trackers implanted in things and we don't know that they're implanted, potentially even sheep to the slaughter, totalitarian regimes that want to mark you. I can take this one off, but what if you couldn't take it off? And what if these devices dictated where you went, what you did, what kinds of access control you had? What if you wanted a private moment that wasn't black boxed, back to base? You'd have to pay for that moment. You'd have to pay for your freedom and your human rights to have that freedom. The elite will be in the box position of having complete anonymity when they want it and complete access of access control. Here's what I'm worried about. These chains can be taken off. What about a future where you couldn't take your implants off? Where they determine what work you ended up in? How many children you could have? And what medical insurance you were covered for, if any? Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't a debate about the mark of the beast. It's not a debate about the vocal minority civil libertarians that will cry out about anything. It's not about the engineers who think this is cool but a little bit weird and freaky. It's about human decency. Consider joining the IEEE SSIT. We're a fun group of people and we're exploring next generation technologies. Thanks so much.